all those who are oppressed and for all those who are tortured in life. Those in Vietnam, are, we are a part of them. Those who are in Latin America, we are part of them. Those who are in Britain itself and the uh, imperialist government in Britain itself who are exploiting the masses, and we believe that this is true. This is true experience. Also, we are fighting for all these people and not for ourselves only. This isn't just a problem for an individual government. This is a global problem requiring a global response. And that means not every man for himself, but governments must hang together or they'll hang separately. Over the world, governments are being forced to decide how to combat the growing menace of terrorism. Today, terrorists and their violent ideas travel swiftly. In a camp like this one run by a Palestinian group, German terrorists Ulrika Meinhof and Andreas Bader were trained. A sort of international Freemasonry of revolutionaries has evolved. The Palestinian revolution allied itself to all liberation movements of the world. And in general, the Palestinian Revolution, and in particular the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, had many members from other liberation organizations. Which countries in particular do they come from? All over. Some of them are Europeans, British, French, some of them from Amer Latin America, from Africa, from all, o all over the world where liberation movements are present. Are there many British? More than you expect. This training camp was run by the Popular Democratic Front, or FD, the group responsible for the killing of 22 Israeli schoolchildren at Marlott. The FD has links with revolutionary groups in Europe, the Third World and the Americas, as Canadian reporter Pierre Nardot found out in 1970. We are from Quebec, Montreal, especially. Why are you here? We are here for training, military training, mostly training. In what purpose? purpose is to make a socialist revolution in Quebec first and in North America second, because we understand that the uh, the revolution in Quebec will never be finished if there's still imp American imperialism. Do you are the two only foreigners here among no. Palestinians? No, I think that in the FD, we are about half of foreigners. There's uh, four Turkish, there's uh, some Lebanese, there's some Syrian. Are there any Americans? They were American and Latin America. Your name is uh, Selim? Selim. And your name is? Selim. What, what is the signification of Selim? It means peace. The international alliances between terrorists were never more devastating than at Tel Aviv airport when three Japanese gunmen opened fire on unsuspecting tourists. Those three Japanese were originally recruited into the United Red Army in Japan. They then went for training in North Korea. Uh, they were then recruited by the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And they went for final training and briefing at a, a refugee camp in Lebanon. From there, they went to Frankfurt, West Germany, where they picked up false papers. From there, they went to Rome, where they were provided with Czech weapons in suitcases, which they loaded into an Air France aircraft and landed at Tel Aviv airport, took out the guns, and shot down 24 people in the baggage. Uh, lounge. Now, the tragedy of that was that the 24 people they shot were most of them Puerto Rican pilgrims who had nothing whatever to do with Israel or the Arabs or politics at all, just victims, innocent victims of indiscriminate terrorism. That is the tragedy. <laughs> 
The 31 people burned alive in this Pan-American plane in Rome were tragic victims of an act of terrorism. In the last eight years, more than 10 and a half thousand civilians, defenseless men, women and children, have been wounded by terrorists. And another 1,573 innocent people have been killed. It seems to me that since we all of us, in fact, do abominate this kind of violence, no matter how much, there might be a trace of almost intellectual prurience in us that's titillated by it. Then we have got to fight against that, as it were, uh, prurience, which is, I suppose, a form of sadism, and suppress it, uh, give it no mileage at all. And the moment society shows that it views this kind of thing as utterly obnoxious, then you're going to have a chance of dealing with it. Now, oddly enough, this ties in very much with the, another aspect of the philosophy of terrorism. Mao's famous sea with the fish. The urban gorilla has to be able to swim like a fish in his sea. Well, if that sea is full of nets and rocks and sticks of dynamite that are going to blow him up and is generally a thoroughly unwelcoming sea, the fish will stop swimming in it. And I think that this applies not merely to the pursuit of the urban gorilla, but to the whole philosophy of violence. To deter the terrorist, in West Germany, they formed anti-gorilla squads. In the United States, expensive and complicated airport screening has proved very effective. Last year, 17 and a half thousand guns and explosives were confiscated. 3,620 passengers were arrested. At this training session, Bavarian state policemen tracked down their man. This year, the 11 West German states will pay out an estimated 1,000 million pounds for security. On top of that, their federal government will spend another 150 million. The New York police have a special hostage unit to deal with a new type of criminal, the politically motivated kidnapper. They're trained not so much to be quick on the draw as to be persuasive negotiators. We were not just looking for young buffaloes to kick indoors. We wanted to utilize the experience that a man has in bringing up a family, in raising children, in dealing with the public day in and day out. These are things that we wanted to utilize. Last year, the New York police went out on 350 kidnap cases. A police psychologist instructs them to address a kidnapper as sir, to act as psychotherapists. The process really is to put somebody that's concerned, that's interested in helping, into the situation where he makes himself known as wanting to help, and then letting the person talk about what's bothering him. The one basic principle that you're going to come out of here with is that human life is the most important uh, commodity. There is nothing else as important as human life. Property can be replaced and recovered. Criminals can be captured some other time. But you can't give somebody back their life. London's Heathrow Airport has now seen several very public security operations involving the army as well as the police. The Metropolitan Police, who are in overall charge of security, have found that world terrorism occurs in cycles. They call in the army with their heavier firepower when terrorist activities abroad suggest there's a possibility of a ground attack, even a missile attack. What we're going to do then is that we're not going to take the ATCs up there, I think, because... Um... The police have so far unearthed 16 possible terrorists, some of whom have been brought to trial and imprisoned, others who've been quickly spirited out of the country. The manoeuvres are largely to demonstrate that Heathrow isn't a soft touch for overseas guerrilla groups. For in the end of the day, can there be any real defence against an enemy who has a choice of millions of targets? Like the British, Canadians aren't used to an intrusive police force. But in 1970, the people of Montreal found one of the most poisonous aspects of terrorism is that often the cure for it 
can involve the curtailing of personal liberty. The violence started with a rash of bombings in the 60s. Over 250 bomb incidents in the capital of the mainly French-speaking province of Quebec. The bombings were the work of the FLQ, the Front for the Liberation of Quebec. It was an anarchist group, the violent spearhead of the wider movement which wanted independence for the province. The FLQ's main support came from young French Canadians who felt they were being treated as second-class citizens. Their heroes were men like lawyer Robert Lemieux. The violence of the FLQ from 63 to 70 wasn't a violence to, to take power. It was something to sensitize the, the, the population of Quebec to their colonial condition. And then it evolved through uh, the 60s to dealing with, with uh, the situation in, in work conflicts, uh, long strikes and so on, and it culminated with, with the kidnappings of 1970. But the kidnappings uh, were perhaps the, the end of that period of time where violence was used to, to sensitize people. The FLQ's first kidnapping victim was James Cross, Britain's trade commissioner. He was seized from the home where he and his family lived in Montreal. They came to the house early in the morning. They rang the bell when the maid opened the door. They said they had a parcel for me. Uh, they asked her to sign for it. They then forced their way in, held her at gunpoint, and one of them came up into the room, into the bedroom where I was dressing, and held me, um, handcuffed me, and then uh, they took me out to a taxi and took me away. The kidnappers were Marc Carboneau, Jacques Longteau, Yves Longlois, Louise and Jacques Cossette Houdel. Police combed the city, but weren't able to find any trace of Cross or his kidnappers, who made their demands known through radio and newspapers. They threatened to kill their victim unless they were given £208,000, freedom for 23 so-called political prisoners, and their manifesto was broadcast on television. Only the final demand was agreed to, and this didn't satisfy the kidnappers or their negotiator. I suggest that the federal government wants to settle this problem at best with an armed confrontation with the uh, FLQ, and at worst with uh, the execution of Mr. Cross. The crisis took on a new dimension when Quebec politician Pierre Laporte was kidnapped from his home by another FLQ cell. The federal government now stepped in, and Prime Minister Trudeau ordered 400 troops to guard diplomats, politicians, and prominent citizens. Some Canadians found the show of armed forces offensive, but Trudeau was unrepentant. Your army troops, you seem to be combating them as almost as though it is a war. And if, if it is a war, oh, is anything that they say have validity? Don't be silly. We're not combating them as it's a war, but we're using some of the army as peace agents in order that the police be more free to do their job as policemen. No, I, I still go back to the choice that you, you have to make don't... in the kind of society that you yeah, live well, in. Well, there's a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is uh, go on and bleed, but it's more important to keep law and order in this society than to... Uh, uh, be worried about uh, weak-kneed people who uh, don't like the looks of, uh, of a at, at any camera. cost? At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. Trudeau then invoked the War Measures Act, which put the country under what was virtually martial law. He went on television to give his reasons. Those who would gain power through terror rule through terror. The government is acting, therefore, to protect your life and your liberty. The government is acting as well to ensure the safe return of Mr. James Cross and Mr. Pierre Laporte. Under the War Measures Act, anyone with a suspect political record could be arrested. One of the first was Robert Lemieux, who was held for four months without trial. Another 340 activists were rounded up. When faced with a challenge to established order, Trudeau acted decisively, some thought harshly. The terrorist's brutal response to Trudeau's action was to murder Pierre Laporte. A shocked nation, including the captive James Cross, learnt that his body had been found in the back of a car. I think the worst moment was the night of Laporte's death. 
because I was watching the television. And from 11.30 onwards, clearly something was happening. Then his body was found. And then the announcement came on, on television and radio that I had been killed and that my body had been found. And I was afraid that my wife might be at home watching this. Luckily, she wasn't. She'd gone to bed earlier. But clearly, in those circumstances, I didn't reckon that my own life expectancy was very high. While the search continued, Cross was held hooded and confined to the corner of one room in a suburban apartment. It was nearly nine weeks before his whereabouts was discovered. Um, I was sitting in my chair, and uh, one of the kidnappers came and put handcuffs on me. Now, this was unusual because uh, although I had hadn't been handcuffed at the very beginning for the first week or so, I had been, my hands had been free by that time for several weeks. I asked him why he'd done this, and he said that the police now knew where I was, that two of their comrades had gone out that day and not come back, so they knew the police must uh, be aware of the, uh, of the place. Knowing they were trapped, the kidnappers sent their last communique. It asked that Bernard Mergler, a lawyer known for his work in the civil rights movement, be sent to negotiate with them. Mergler arrived, alone and unarmed, to identify James Cross and explain to the kidnappers the government's plan for their safe conduct to Cuba. Well, I insisted upon speed because the whole area, I learned when I arrived there, was cordoned off by <coughs> a few thousand soldiers, provincial policemen, municipal policemen, federal policemen, and many, many uh, curiosity seekers. And I visualized photographers might have started taking pictures, jumping on the car, and someone might have misinterpreted what was happening. And as they were armed, it could have started shooting. The lawyer was the first to leave the building, followed by the kidnappers and a handcuffed James Cross. And firstly, remember, I hadn't seen the sun for two months. I'd been in a completely enclosed room, and I came out into one of those very bright Montreal days, with the sun beating down on the snow shock of light in one's eyes. And wherever you looked, there were lines of soldiers and people collected it. Absolutely undescribable uh, event. And the drive? Well, the drive was rather hair-raising. There was this clapped-out old car, which Carboneau was driving, had scraped on the garage door as he came out, so he did go back in and drive out again. So it, it really was a sort of keystone cops circle down and streets lined with troops and motorcycle cops roaring in and out. I was in the middle of the back seat and Langto had dynamite on him and a gun, of course. But the back door of the old car was a bit shaky, so every time we went round a corner, the door would start swinging and Langto would reach out to grab and I would reach out to grab Langto because I didn't want him sort of falling out and the dynamite going off and the whole lot of us going up. It really was rather a crazy ride. The price of Cross's freedom was that the five kidnappers went unpunished. Mergler handed them over to the reluctant Cubans. It was evening before they began their journey into exile. Today, nearly five years after the event, some people are still critical of the way Trudeau handled the crisis. I believe that the whole problem could have been solved much faster if they had did not pass the War Measures Act. I think the War Measures Act served as a barrier, an obstacle to ordinary police investigation. They had all the policemen busy questioning 450 detainees, many of whom should, by no stretch of imagination, been deprived of their liberty. And instead of going out and trying to find where Mr. Cross was hidden, they were spending uh, 12, 16 hours a day picking up other people and questioning them. But if small groups of armed men, whatever their cause, hold a whole society to ransom, surely that society has to come down very but strongly on them. If there is an insurrection, then the society has the right, no matter what society is, to defend itself but it does not have the right to pretend that there's an insurrection when there is none, and then take away the rights. 
it, it, to me, this is more frightening than the kidnapping of one man. If a state uh, is elected democratically, its first business is to govern. And if people uh, say, well, we don't accept the result of the election because the people are dumb or misinformed or they're not uh, politically literate, uh, we will force independence by, by kidnapping and assassination. Sure, the first duty of the state is to put them down. And uh, I have no hesitation in believing that that's the only course to take a parallel um, when you're dealing with, uh, with hijackers or international terrorists. Uh, what do you do? You say, my gosh, their cause is just, uh, you know, uh, they're taking off an airload of uh, 100 innocent people, but, uh, or they're blowing up uh, a lot of innocent people uh, in a city, but, uh, you know, we've got to, uh, got to recognize the right of revolution. I think the end does not justify the means. In each election since the crisis, the Quebec separatist movement has gained ground. The FLQ remains an outlawed organization, and no more bombings or kidnappings have been attributed to it. 38-year-old Robert Lemieux is now a petrol pump attendant in a remote part of Quebec. Further south on the American continent, the small country of Uruguay spawned an underground group far better organized than the FLQ. Uruguay had the first welfare state program in Latin America, including a generous pension scheme, free medical care and education. Nevertheless, in the 60s, with a sagging economy, rampant inflation, and its political parties riddled with corruption, it was seething with unrest. Out of this ferment grew the Tupamares, as this film which was made on their behalf explains. It is 1962. The sugar workers from the northern parts of the country march more than 300 miles to the capital, Montevideo. They want an end to their miserable living conditions and demand to be able to farm the land not used by the big landowners. They were organized into unions by Raoul Sendic, a lawyer from the capital city. Despite four peaceful marches, they make no headway. Patience comes to an end. This is the beginning of the national liberation movement. In its efforts to suppress the Tupamaras, or the MLN, the government invoked emergency powers, arrest without trial, heavy press censorship, and the banning of some left-wing groups. There were mass arrests and rumors of torture. Yes, excuses. La expresión más terminante del poder burgués, la posibilidad de coaccionar a la gente, haciéndole perder su libertad. Frente a eso, se estableció en el país una cárcel donde el pueblo, a través de su organización revolucionaria, ejerciera su propia justicia. Esta idea sencilla, pero no por eso menos profunda, políticamente está en la base de la institución cárcel del pueblo. The Tupamara's first kidnapping victim was Ulysses Pereira Riverbell, seen here judging a beauty contest. He was head of the state telephone company, an ultra-right winger and close friend of the president. His kidnapping was designed to show that the government was powerless to protect its supporters. He was released after five days. Having gained his freedom, he urged the government to take even more oppressive measures to crush the guerrillas. So 18 months later, they kidnapped him a second time, sentencing him to life imprisonment. It was 14 months before he was rescued by the army. While he was in the people's prison, he was filmed and interviewed by the Tupamaras. Se denuncia que en las cárceles y fuertes del régimen se tortura a los presos políticos. ¿Qué opina usted? Bueno, indudablemente que si esos métodos son ciertos. La pregunta casi que es innecesaria. Si se conoce mi manera de pensar, yo no puedo estar de acuerdo con eso. ¿Usted ha sido torturado aquí? No. ¿Sometido a algún tipo de presiones? Tampoco. The Tupamaras bombed foreign company offices, seized millions of pounds from banks and casinos, stole arms from garrisons, and even set up their own radio system. 
their selective terrorism was all part of a deliberately worked out long term strategy. Toda revolución cumple etapas. La primera etapa es la construcción de la organización revolucionaria. La sigue otra etapa donde esa organización se afianza y se condiciona para poder operar en forma más o menos sistemática. Luego, en un tercer momento, debe aparecer como un poder dentro de otro poder. Pasar después a transcurrir la etapa de ser una alternativa real de poder. Pero fue su política de kidnapping que más embarrassed the government. In 1971, they seized the British ambassador, Jeffrey Jackson, and demanded the release of 150 prisoners. Today, safely back in his London home, Sir Jeffrey and his wife, Evelyn, both believe that the governments of Britain and Uruguay were right to stand firm and refuse to negotiate. Whilst I was frankly being clobbered in this large black governmental limousine, almost simultaneously, uh, as I was saying to them, you've done the wrong thing, you'll get nothing out of this, no money, no, no, no hostages. My wife was saying exactly the same thing to the foreign minister of the country concerned, and of course my government said it shortly afterwards, and so right from the beginning, it was clear that this could only, in fact, have a public relations value, a kind of shock value for my captors. To the frustration of the government, 12,000 troops and police failed to find the ambassador. For the first six weeks, he was held in a basement cage, which was twice flooded with sewage a foot deep. Later, he was moved to a less disgusting, but very cramped prison cage. He imposed a strict self-discipline, doing on-the-spot exercises, practicing total recall, and creating and memorizing children's stories. I had to think of myself institutionally, and not as a chap. I mean, as a chap, the only thing to do was to treat oneself as rather a joke. I mean, when you're half naked and surrounded by sewage, as it were, uh, which for the first several weeks, uh, rather more than that, it was the case. You can't take yourself too seriously. But I always took the function seriously. But when I was down in this hole, what happened to Jackson as a man was something for him to handle. But what happened to the representative of my nation? Yes, that was a serious matter. So I didn't mind how undignified I was made to feel but the moment it became what I stood for, that was a different matter. This was not a people's prison, this was a British embassy, because I was in it. Obviously, your ordeal must have left marks on you. Do you think that it has left marks on those men? I'm going to say something which I hope doesn't sound too atrocious, but uh, I am going to watch, as it were, the terrorist chart very carefully for such years as are left to me because I have a profound conviction that the suicide rate amongst uh, ex-terrorists is going to be very much higher than, uh, than the average because there were already amongst my captors, I felt, the glimmering of signs that they were finding it difficult to live with themselves. And, of course, by the moment that the, uh, the charge of adrenaline that all this activity involves begins to fade, and also the different attitudes as age comes on, middle age and then old age and so on, and one standard change, I just don't see how some of these obviously idealistic and sensitive young people are going to be able to sleep with what they remember they were responsible for. It was eight months before the ambassador was freed by the guerrillas. Only three days after 106 Tupamaras had made a spectacular jail escape. A Tupamara communique said he was of no further use to them. In 1972, the president declared a state of internal war. Within a year, the army had crushed the Tupamaras. Only time will tell whether irrevocably. Some fled abroad and formed links with other South American guerrilla groups. But to date, the Tupamara's main achievement seems to have been an erosion of the democratic institutions and the quality of life in Uruguay. The sad thing about Uruguay is that it had been one of the most uh, liberal societies in Latin America. It had, hadn't had, a, it was about one of the only ones that had never had a military coup. And it was really, in, in many ways, a model society. And of course, part of revolutionary philosophy is that uh, a well-established liberal democracy is simply not vulnerable to Marxist revolution. There's never been a successful Marxist revolution in a well-established uh, liberal society. So 
they've got to make it repressive first. And so the two Pomarios set about uh, trying to do just that, uh, to make it repressive, in the hope that people would rise against the government and then their alternative government that they were offering uh, would be able to step in. But in the event, uh, they did bring about the repression, but the people did not rise against the government. The people rose against them and with the people's support, the government almost totally destroyed them, leaving Uruguay, sadly, uh, one of the uh, most repressive societies even by Latin American standards. Kidnapping of diplomats wasn't the sole prerogative of the Tupamares. In some South American states, it became almost an occupational hazard for foreign envoys. American Foreign Service officers have been particularly vulnerable, although in high-risk areas, their embassies are guarded by the Marines. Since 1968, 27 American diplomats have been kidnapped and eight have been murdered. The anti-terrorist unit operates from the heart of the State Department building in Washington. Its control room is specially equipped with computers that absorb information about terrorist activity all over the world. Until recently, it was run by Ambassador Louis Hofacker. As a matter of policy, we, uh, we have not paid ransom for uh, our people. Uh, and as a matter of policy, we don't uh, release prisoners. And the logic is that there would be no ceiling to the, uh, to the demands and that the vulnerability of our people would be increased by payment of ransom. Um, now, companies and individuals have followed other uh, patterns, other logic, and uh, have paid uh, some of reportedly over $14 million, which has not reduced the vulnerability to their people. And uh, I know some companies which, wish, uh, which have wished that that precedent had not begun. The kidnapping of business executives has proved far more lucrative and is also more telling revolutionary propaganda than the seizing of diplomats. Those who study political violence have watched the sums paid out in ransom spiral. To what use do the guerrillas put this money? Well, uh, in different ways. In Latin America, for example, there's one group in Argentina which is reputed to have had $30 million in ransoms, which they're using to finance four other groups. Uh, the Palestinians get a tremendous amount from Libya, from oil money, which means, of course, that we actually finance them at the petrol pumps. They also, of course, get support, although not financial support so much, from uh, sympathetic groups in the countries in which they operate. The mutual support between many of today's revolutionary groups can be traced back to the student riots of the 60s. In Germany, the ruthlessness with which the police reacted to the unrest fueled yet more militancy. Out of this turbulence grew the sinister German Red Army faction, better known as the Bader Meinhof Gang. Like the Japanese Red Army and the more extreme Palestinian groups, they want a world revolution to overthrow capitalism. The real terrorism began in 1968 when they set fire to a Frankfurt department store. Later, the gang led by Andreas Bader and Ulrika Meinhof, once a committed pacifist, began terrorizing Germany with a brutal efficiency that belied their small numbers. On the 1st of June, 1972, 250 police surrounded a house in Frankfurt. After a shootout, three terrorists, including Mainz and Bader, were captured. In the exchange of fire, Bader was wounded in the leg. Soon after, Ulrika Meinhof was captured. Today, four of the gang are on trial facing charges including six murders, 71 cases of attempted murder, and a series of bank robberies. The charge sheet runs to 354 pages. With 46 gang members in jail, most Germans thought that the bader meinhof reign of terror was over. But even behind bars, they'd managed to carry on with their violent crusade. The gang surfaced to murder Herr Gunther von Drenkmann, president of the West Berlin Supreme Court. 
His funeral brought thousands of West Berliners onto the streets, an impressive display of support for the authorities. It seems that each act of terrorism in Germany has strengthened the forces of law and order. Only three days before the West Berlin mayoral elections, terrorists kidnapped the opposition candidate Peter Lorenz. In exchange for his life, they demanded the release of five fellow anarchists in German jails and that each should be given £3,600. These demands were met in exchange for Lorenz's freedom. The kidnappers disappeared without trace. Even their victim, when questioned by reporters after his release, was unable to give any clues as to his captor's identity. Do you have any idea at all? No, no idea. Are you in favour of stronger police action against terrorists? The unenviable dilemma of whether to risk Lorenz's life or give in to the terrorist blackmail had to be decided by his political rival for the control of West Berlin's city hall, Mayor Klaus Schutz. I'm quite sure in East Berlin, not very far from here, they would let the man easily killed. They would do everything to catch them. Hmm? But they would, would never dream of, of uh, uh, looking after uh, the demands of the kidnappers. But this is the difference, and I think it's a very good difference. It's a, it's a difference which I want to. I'm proud to live in a country which is able to meet demands like this because it looks for the private individual, and the private individual has an organization which looks after him, even if he's in, if he, even if he's in despair situation. It's possible for a government only to be as firm as it knows it can carry its public with it. Now, I think the Germans have given way, uh, I think they've been uh, ill-advised to do so, in fact, but they've given way because they felt that uh, this was what their public wished them to do. It's a case of sensing what the public mood is. Now, for example, after the bombs in Birmingham in November 1974, uh, when 21 people were killed, there was a tremendous wave of feeling of fury over that because this was... Uh, two pubs in an industrial city on pay night with a lot of young people who have drawn their pay packets being blown up. There was a fury. And I think that the measures introduced by Mr Jenkins, uh, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, were just about right. Because if he'd done anything less, I think there was a risk that the public might take the law into their own hands. And if he'd done anything more, it could be classed as repressive. Marian Dunhoff, publisher and former editor of the influential political weekly Die Zeit, is worried that Mayor Schutz's decision has undermined West Germany's judicial system. I think the, the most precious thing really is <clears throat> the rule of law. Um, if, like myself, you have lived through a period where that didn't exist, I mean the fascist period in Germany, uh, then you only appreciate what it means to have it. I have lost uh, almost all my friends in that period and some of my family. And uh, I know that you can't preserve individual lives, which is the alternative, which is always put to us, um, if there is no rule of law. But also, I feel that if a government doesn't react adequately to violence, then uh, it may very well happen that people uh, take uh, the law into their own hands and this will certainly serve to the coming up of a certain right-wing radicalism. Now, in this case, for instance, as I had expected, next day two MPs came up uh, with uh, uh, the demand to reintroduce uh, this sentence in this country. And this is bound to happen. People get angry if the government doesn't act and protects them. And this is probably exactly what the terrorists want, isn't it? And this is exactly what they want. I mean, they, uh, it's not that much that they want these specific four or six or how many there are uh, prisoners. What they want is to undermine uh, the state. Encouraged by their successful kidnapping of Lorenz, Bader Meinhof terrorists tried a repeat performance in Stockholm a month later. They stormed the West German embassy, killing a diplomat and threatening to kill 11 hostages unless the West German government released 26 Bader Meinhof prisoners. Shocked with pain, a woman victim is carried to safety. Chancellor Helmut Schmidt refused the terrorists' demands. In response, the gang dynamited the building. 
One terrorist died and another was mortally wounded in the blazing building. No one can predict when or where the terrorists will strike next or what their demands will be. You could think of anything. You could think that uh, suddenly these very political minded people in our country would say uh, either you, uh, you declare that you leave NATO or uh, we will shoot uh, the minister so and so which we happen to have as a hostage. I mean, you can apply this, it doesn't apply only to uh, prisoners or to money. You could uh, blackmail a government to do political things which they uh, never would dream of otherwise. And do you think there is a probability of that? Oh, yes, why not? I mean, as soon as they get somebody high up, or it needn't even be somebody high up, it could be uh, a class of children or what not. I mean, what, what are you going to do if they say we, we will shoot uh, 30 children or so if you don't do this or that? You can be blackmailed into almost everything. But on the whole, you must make up your mind. Are you going to defend your community and your society by being tough? Or are you going to give in because you feel uh, the, the most important thing is to save the individual life? And in that case, I think you must uh, really um, bear in mind that uh, it's not the case of one individual life. Uh, it can well come to a state where you can't uh, save uh, individual lives any longer. The whole society, so to speak, is then going to pieces. Our society is so complex, it's impossible to guard it at every point. And in trying to protect the lives of its citizens, government forces are tied up in security duty. In Whitehall at the Institute for Defence Studies, Air Vice Marshal Stuart Menel believes that because completely effective prevention is so difficult, we must deter the terrorist, particularly the hijacker, by acting more decisively when he strikes. So we're faced with a problem in Western society. Do we take these more extreme measures to curb hijacking and potential violence, or do we let things drift as they are until the escalation reaches the point where whole cities, maybe whole countries, can be held to ransom by a handful of unscrupulous people? What worries me is what is being cooked up now by potential hijackers. Uh, when it is shown that their activities pay off, uh, then quite clearly escalation enters into the equation. Hijacking an eight million pound Boeing 707 is one thing. Holding a whole city to ransom is something quite different. What do you mean a whole city held to ransom? Well, if one projects in the scientific world uh, a few years ahead uh, to see the sort of weapons that might be made by hijackers if they happen to have um, training in certain uh, fields of science, I'm thinking now particularly of nuclear physics. The possibility of being able to get hold of or manufacture uh, a small nuclear weapon is entirely within the bounds of possibility. There'd be very little difficulty in a hijacker, so trained and so equipped, uh, taking an aeroplane, flying over the center of a city and informing whichever government he was uh, attempting to coerce that if they did not give in to his demands, he would drop the weapon over the center of that city. In an attempt to prevent the terrorists' apparently easy manipulation of aircraft and airports, 69 governments have signed the Hague Convention, guaranteeing they'll prosecute or extradite terrorists who commit crimes on one of their airlines or force a landing at one of their airports. But so far, when the crunch has come, few governments have stood by this agreement. I'm afraid that terrorism is almost certain to increase because it seems to pay in, in the short term. However much it doesn't pay in the long term, it seems to pay in the short term in terms of ransoms, publicity, and uh, governments giving concessions, releasing prisoners, and so on. And the problem is whether to confront or concede, and the extent to which a government can stand up to it depends on how far it can carry its public opinion with it, and that depends on public education. But just as important as that, I think, is to understand the terrorists themselves, the sort of young people, that tiny proportion of young people who become terrorists, 
to try to understand why they do and so to handle them as to prevent this happening. Because the tragedy is that however idealistic they may be and however attractive they may seem to be as people in their idealism, their victims are almost certainly innocent people indiscriminately killed uh, who have nothing to do with the problem and it's their flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of innocent people that is the result of all their idealism. You know, there are two kinds of violence, reactionary violence and revolutionary violence. The reactionary one is against humanity, but the revolutionary one is to regain humanity. But thinking like this, when you were mingling with the passengers, when you were going to hijack that plane and imperil their lives, there were children on those planes. Now, in the first hijacking, I saw a girl of 12 years. I wanted to tell her, I want to protect you to tell you that I'm your friend, even though I'm having a, ha a hand grenade and I want to hijack a plane. So we care very much about the people because we are str uh, uh, struggling for the people. We are not uh, struggling for myself. I'm not struggling only for myself, not only for my organization. I'm struggling for all the oppressed in the world. You can talk about, as it were, controlled schizophrenia, of the person who can divide their view of the universe um, right down the middle so that the same person who could weep to see a little child cut their finger will be quite cold when its head is blown off by a random bomb. So to me, all of these things are, as it were, anti-human. Uh, and the tragedy of this approach, which is simply not prepared to use the evolutionary approach, which isn't prepared to say, if my son sees light at the end of the tunnel, if it's only a fraction more, I know that to the people sweating through it at the time, it's, it's horrible, it's agony, it's hell. I and mean, I can think of so many cases in the world today where it's agony to, for people to go through what they are going, but for heaven's sake, no injustice in the world is big enough to be cured by an even greater injustice, surely. It's sometimes argued that it's inevitable for innocent blood to be shed to bring about radical change, that violence is the only way. So perhaps it's worth questioning not only the doubtful morality of that proposition, but also the effectiveness of such methods. Violence may appear to pay in the short term in terms of ransoms or getting prisoners released, but in the long term it never does pay. It's always counterproductive. And the really big social changes, in fact, come about by peaceful means. I mean, uh, in the uh, progress for the black community in America, far more was achieved long before the violence began by Martin Luther King with his non-violent movement, uh, getting the vote and so on. Far more was achieved than by the uh, subsequent violence. Um, the uh, uh, Gandhi, with his uh, non-violent uh, passive resistance, achieved far more than any violent movement would achieve, which would have just been repressed with, uh, no doubt, uh, heavy loss of life, whereas, it, as it was, uh, he achieved a tremendous amount. Um, I believe that the Germans, in occupying France, had much more actual trouble and difficulty arising from the passive resistance of people just refusing to cooperate than from all the violent resistance movements, however heroic, uh, put together. 